In this lecture, we will go over the CFA Level 1 reading on swap markets and contracts. This is a relatively short reading. In the introduction, we will talk about the basics of swaps. Section 2 deals with the structure of global swap markets. And what you'll see here will look familiar because it is quite similar to what you saw on the reading in forward contracts. And finally, the bulk of the reading is covered here in section 3, where we will talk about different types of swaps. A swap is an agreement between two parties to exchange a series of future cash flows, or we can say swap future cash flows. Typically, one party makes a payment based on a random outcome or a variable such as a floating interest rate, LIBO being perhaps one of the most popular floating rates, and the other party makes a payment based on a fixed rate. This variable payment could also be an equity return, it could be a currency rate, and so on. We'll see several examples of swaps as we cover this reading. Here let's talk about a very simple interest rate swap where we have two parties A and B and let's say that they swap interest payments. A makes payments based on a floating rate. Let's say that floating rate is LIBOR and B makes payments based on a fixed rate of let's say 4%. Now, the way this works is there is an initial notional principle based on which these payments are made. Say the notional principle is 100 million and these two parties agree that the swap is a two-year swap and payments will be made semi-annually. In other words, we will have four settlement dates a settlement date at the end of every six months. At the end of the first settlement date, party A will make a payment based on LIBOR and party B will make a payment based on this 4% rate. The 4% rate, which is the rate that is paid by the fixed rate party, is called the swap rate. Generally, swaps are known or referred to based on the fixed rate and the duration or tenor of the swap. The rate paid by the fixed rate pair in this example is 4%. B is the floating rate pair and this particular party is paying LIBOR. The settlements date here have been defined as twice a year or every six months. Generally, with interest rate swaps, we have netting. So the notional principle is netted initially in the sense that we don't have A paying B 100 million and B paying A 100 million. That notional amount is effectively netted. And then even at each settlement date, we figure out how much A owes B, how much B owes A, and then the net amount is paid by the entity which owes to the entity which is to receive the higher amount. And we'll see numerical examples later in this lecture. Termination date is where the swap ends. This overall period of the swap is called the tenor. Swaps start with a zero value at initiation. So the interest rates are set such that neither party is winning. If I take this simple example, the swap rate or the fixed rate of 4% will be set based on expectations of LIBO over this period. So at time zero, the value is zero. The value of the swap is zero. However, as we enter the swap, when interest rates change or if interest rates become different from what was expected, then the swap will have value. As with other derivative contracts, the swap is a contract between A and B in this case. And let's say that the interest rates start going up and they go up more than expected. Then clearly 
the party which is receiving the floating payment of LIBO is benefiting. So the value of the contract is positive then for party B and negative for party A. Let's now talk about how we terminate swaps. A party might want to terminate a swap before its formal expiration. This can be accomplished in several ways. So if we have a two-year swap and at the end of one year, let's say one of the parties which is paying floating wants to get out because the rates have gone up much more than expected and the rates might be going up even further. So there are a few different ways this might be done. Here is the first possible way of terminating a swap where one party pays the swap value to the other party. On the previous slide, I mentioned that the value of the swap at time zero is zero, but then the value changes. So if we have a situation where the value is positive for party A, negative for party B, then party B could pay A a certain amount where both A and B agree on that amount and terminate the swap. For this to happen, the swap contract needs to state up front that this is a possible way of terminating a swap before the formal expiration. So that is mentioned here. This is possible if both parties agree at swap initiation that such a transaction can be made. The other scenario is an offsetting contract where if party A is making a floating payment and receiving fixed, then it is possible that party A gets into another contract with C where it takes the opposite position. So here if A is paying floating, then in this contract with C, it receives float and pays fixed. So effectively the float and float cancel out Obviously, the fixed rates will probably be different, but it will be a fixed or known amount. The third method is resale, where a party takes that contract and sells the contract to someone else. But as you will see on the next slide, the swap market is a over the counter market. It generally involves custom contracts that are created between parties. So generally this does not happen. And the final strategy is a swaption. A swaption is an option to enter into a swap. It is possible that you have party A which got into a swap to pay float and received fixed at the time that the party entered into the swap, let's say it also purchased a swaption. A swaption is an option to enter into a swap. So if party A also purchases a swap which is opposite to this, so allows A to enter into a swap where it receives float and pays fixed, then at a later point in time, if A wants to get out of this swap, then it can exercise the swaption, take the opposite position, which would effectively offset the initial swap. If you understood this explanation, that is good. If you did not, then don't worry too much about this. Just, re just remember the fact that a swaption is a method of terminating a swap. This material will be covered in a lot of detail at level 2. The structure of global swap markets. Swaps are custom instruments. They are traded in the over-the-counter market. As with forward markets, we have a network of dealers which are generally large international banks and investment banks. You can look at exhibit one in the curriculum for a list of major dealers and end users for different types of swaps. This is a largely unregulated market. Credit risk or default risk is a concern, but since we have these institutions which are quite credit worthy, default risk or credit risk is generally low. Now we come to the major component of this reading, which is different types of swaps. 
as with other derivative contracts, the type of swaps are defined by the underlying. So if the underlying is a currency, then we say we have a currency swap. If the swap is based on an interest rate, then we have interest rate swaps and so on. Here we will focus on these three types. We can also have commodity swaps and other types of swaps, but these are not mentioned in the learning objectives, so we will not cover them. Let's start with a currency swap. And to explain the swap, I will use the example in the curriculum. We have a US company called Target, which is a large retailer. This company wants to expand in Germany and needs Euro. Target is not well known in Germany, so the cost of borrowing Euro in Germany would be high. So what is the solution? Here is what Target could do. Target could raise $10 million in the US market from bondholders. And since Target is very well known in the United States, this cost of borrowing would be relatively low. If you recall from fixed income, issuing a bond and raising money through a bond issue is effectively a way of borrowing from bondholders. But Target needs Euro because it is expanding in Germany. So it engages with its strategic partner, Deutsche Bank, which happens to be very well known in Germany. And Target and Deutsche Bank have a good relationship. So Target can engage in a currency swap with Deutsche Bank, where Target gives Deutsche Bank 10 million at time zero, and at the same time receives 9 million from Deutsche Bank. So effectively, Target has borrowed 9 million from Deutsche Bank and Deutsche Bank has borrowed 10 million dollars from Target. Then on a six monthly basis, both companies make interest payments. So on the right hand side, we are talking about the swap based on the 9 million that Target borrowed. This is the 9 million euro Target is going to make interest payments to Deutsche Bank and the calculation of the interest payments are shown on the next slide. And since effectively Deutsche Bank has borrowed dollars, Deutsche Bank will be making interest payments in dollars. And then Target needs to make the coupon payments or interest payments to shareholders. So that is what is happening here. In this example, the amount that Target receives from Deutsche Bank is a little lower than the amount that it needs to pay bondholders. And finally, at the end of the swap, let's say that this is a three year swap. At the end of three years, Target is going to return the 10 million notional principal to bondholders. And where is the 10 million coming from? It is coming from Deutsche Bank, which is returning the 10 million that it took initially and Target returns the 9 million euro back to Deutsche Bank. Generally with currency swaps, the actual currency is swapped. So typically we do not do netting with currency swaps unless it is explicitly stated in the contract. So the notional principle is not netted and also typically the interest payments are not netted. Here is the calculation. The initial swap of principal amounts is shown here. Then the semi-annual payments are calculated here. The rate on the dollar is 5.5%. And since this is semi-annual, we have 180 over 360 multiplied by 10 million. So that's the six monthly interest payment on dollars. This is the six monthly interest payment on euro. After five years, the principal amounts are returned. In the example that I just gave, both parties paid a fixed rate. So the party borrowing dollars paid a fixed rate on dollars and the party borrowing euro paid a fixed rate on euro. It is also possible that the parties agree up front that say the dollar party is paying a fixed rate and the euro party is paying a floating rate. 
or it is possible that the dollar party pays a floating rate and the euro party pays a fixed rate and finally it is possible that both parties agree to pay a floating rate this material will be covered in more detail at level 2 but i'll give you a simple scenario let's say that both parties agree on a floating rate where the party that borrowed dollars pays based on LIBO and the party that borrows euro pays based on Euribor. Then the payments would look like this. Let's just say that here are the first three settlement dates and let's say that we have the LIBO and Euribor numbers. So let's say that LIBO numbers are 4% and then 5% and 6% and Euribor numbers 3%, 4%, 5%. There will be a certain notional principle. Let's say the notional principle is 100 million. The payment over here at the end of period one will be based on LIBOR and Euribor at the start of the period. So the party that is making interest payments in dollars will take 4% and this will be de-annualized if this is a six month period and that would be multiplied by the notional principle. The party that is making interest payments in euro will take the 3% rate multiply by notional principle. Again, the 3% will have to be de-annualized and we'll come up with the euro payment over here. Similarly, the payment here at the end of the second settlement period will be based on rates at the end of period one, which is the same as the start of period two. Now I want you to do the simple example and then you will do example one from the curriculum. So try this before looking at the solution. Here is what you need to do. At time t equal to zero, the US company and the counterparty swap. So the US company gives $10 million or lends $10 million to the counterparty and the counterparty lends 90 million euro to the US party. The US party now is going to pay interest in euro and that's going to be 90 multiplied by the euro rate of 3% deannualized because we have two periods per year. So 0.03 over 2. The interest payments every six months are 1.35 million euro. The US company will receive interest payments in dollars, 100 into 0.02 over 2, so that is 1 million. And then at the end or at termination, the principal amounts will be returned. So the counterparty will return the 100 million and the US company will return the 90 million euro. Now I want you to do example one from the curriculum. Interest rate swaps. The most common type of an interest rate swap is called a plain vanilla interest rate swap. And this is an interest rate swap in which one party pays a fixed rate and the other party pays a floating rate such as LIBOR with both sets of payments in the same currency. And here is a classic example of an interest rate swap. I want you to do this before looking at the solution. Here is how you should set it up. So A is the floating rate pair paying LIBO. B is the fixed rate pair paying 5%. At time t equal to 0, these payments are actually netted out with interest rate swaps where we are dealing with the same currency. It doesn't make sense for A to give 100,000 to B and B to give 100,000 to A. So these are netted out. First settlement date is right here, end of six months. To calculate the payments here, we need to use LIBOR at the start of the period, which was time zero. So A pays LIBOR of 5% divided by 2, which is 2.5%. B pays 5% over 2. So at the end of period one, there is no payment because both are equal. At the end of period two, 
we use LIBOR at the start of period 2, which is 6%, and then for a 6-month period, we have half of that, which is 3%. B pays the fixed rate of 2.5% per 6-month period. Net effect is that A pays 0.5%. This is 0.5% of the notional principle of 100,000. So A is going to pay 500. Again, note that this 500 is a net payment. So even the interest payments are netted. This slide is based on Exhibit 5 in the curriculum. Let's say that you are the CFO of General Electric and here is your situation. You have borrowed long term from the Bank of America and you are making interest payments based on a floating rate. So specifically your interest payments are LIBOR plus 25 basis points. You are concerned about interest rates going up and hence your payments going up. So what can you do to convert this floating rate loan into essentially a fixed rate loan? Think about it before moving on. Here is what can happen. You can engage in a interest rate swap. Let's say that your financial partner is JP Morgan. So if you engage in a swap where you as General Electric make a fixed payment and receive floating, so that's over here, then effectively you cancel out the floating payments. So note that you are receiving payments based on LIBOR, you are making payments based on LIBOR and you are making a fixed payment here. So effectively what you have done here is eliminated LIBOR. So what is the net effect? The net effect is that you still need to make this 25 basis points payment and you have fixed payments of 6.25. So Effectively, your payments now are 6.45% fixed. From an exam perspective, I think this concept is extremely important because it is also heavily used in the industry. Okay, another example. Bank A enters into a 100,000 quarterly pay or quarter pay plain vanilla interest rate swap as the fixed rate pair and the fixed rate is 6%. For simplicity, we will stick with the 360 day here. On the exam, you might get questions where they specify 365 days. There you just have to divide by 365. So read the rest of the question and then calculate the amounts that bank A pays or receives on these days. Here is how you set this up. Recognize that this is a quarter pay plain vanilla swap. So each period now is one quarter. We are showing the LIBOR numbers at the start of every quarter. A is the fixed rate pair based on a 6% rate. So every quarter A will pay 6% divided by 4 which is 1.5%. So those are the numbers shown over here. Every quarter A gets money based on LIBOR at the start of the period. So at the start of period 1, the rate is 4%, which means that over here A will get 4% divided by 4, which is 1%. The net effect is that A pays 0.5%. This is 0.5% of the notional principle. You do the same for the end of period 2, end of period 3. Here A is going to get 5% divided by 4, which is 1.25%. So the net payment that A needs to make is 0.25%. And at the end of period 4, the net payment is 0.125%. Here is a classic example of what you might see on the exam. So think about it. The correct answer is A. 
A will benefit when interest rates increase because when interest rates go up, this variable payment is going up, so A will receive more. But at the same time, A is paying a fixed rate, so A is the correct answer. Now do example 2 from the curriculum, which is based on an interest rate swap. Equity swaps. In an equity swap, at least one party pays the equity return. And by equity return, we mean the return on a stock or the return on a stock portfolio or the return on a stock index. The counterparty could pay an equity return. So this could be the return on another index or the counterparty could pay a fixed interest rate or a floating interest rate such as LIBOR. Now, just to illustrate, you have party A and let's say that this party is paying the return on the S&P 500 and then you have party B which is paying the return based on the Russell 5000. So this is an example of a equity swap where both parties are paying the return based on an equity index. Obviously these have to be different equity indices otherwise the swap would not make any sense. You can also have a situation where you have party A and party B. A is paying the return based on some index and B is paying based on LIBOR. Obviously in all these scenarios we need to specify a notional principle. And finally you can have a situation where you have A and B. A is paying based on a index and B is paying a fixed rate of say 5%. You need to recognize that in an equity swap, the party making the fixed payment could also have to make a variable payment. And this is important to understand. Let's say that we are looking at this scenario where A is making an index payment B is making what appears to be a fixed payment of 5%. So take a situation, we have this period where let's say that the index starts at 1000 and then at the end of the period the index is at 900. Now what is going on here? We have a situation where the index has gone down. So we can say that the index return is actually minus 10%. What are the payments involved? So over here, A is making the index return. The way we look at it is A makes a payment of minus 10% and B makes a payment here of 5%. What is the overall effect? A making a payment of minus 10% means that A is actually receiving 10%. So in this scenario, what is happening is B is going to pay 5% plus minus 10% or actually the effect over here is that B is going to pay 15%. So it's not really just a fixed payment of 5%. When the index goes down, this party over here, the pay fixed party actually makes a variable payment. Here that payment is 15%. The other point to remember is that the payment is not known until the end of the settlement period. In the earlier swaps, the interest rate swap and the currency swap, the payment at the end of the period was known based on interest rates at the start of the period. But with an equity swap, since the payment is based on the equity return over the period, we only know the payment at the end of the period. So in this example, only once we know the value of the index at the end of the period, can we calculate the exact amount that a given party needs to pay. Let's do some examples and these examples will help you understand the concepts that we are talking about. I want you to try this first on your own. This is an equity swap example where one party is paying a equity return and the other party is paying what is called a fixed return.
here is how you set this up so this is you you are paying based on the index return and you are receiving five percent so the counterparty here is the fixed rate pair and you are the index return pair in the first period so that's the first six months the index goes up from thousand to one thousand one hundred you are paying the index return so you pay 10% because the index went up by 10%. Conveniently, our notional principle is 100 million. So you pay 10% of 100 million, which is 10 million. You get 2.5%. Notice that the fixed rate is 5%, but this is a annualized number. We are looking at a six month period. So you get the rate for a six month period, which is 2.5%. Net effect is that you pay 7.5 million. Obviously, on the equity return front, the 10% is 10% for a six month period. So you don't need to deannualize this 10% number. It is already deannualized. In the second period, the equity return is approximately minus 18.2%. So now you are paying minus 18.2%. Paying minus 18.2% is the same thing as getting 18.2%. From this 5%, as before, you get 2.5%. So overall, you get approximately 20.7%, which is 20.7 million with this notional principle. So I hope that by doing this example, you also get a sense for how equity swaps can be useful. If you are a small cap portfolio manager, there are chances that or there will be times when you are bearish on the market. And there might also be circumstances that do not allow you to liquidate your portfolio. So this example shows how you can hedge yourself even when you are bearish on the market. This example shows how you can hedge yourself when you are bearish on the market and are constrained in terms of your ability to sell the portfolio. Also, this example illustrates the concept that the fixed rate pair might have to make variable payments, which is the scenario in the second period over here. Here is another example where you are now paying based on one equity index and receiving based on another index. So try this before looking at the solution. Here is what's going on. The small cap index went up by 10%. And since you are the small cap index pair, you need to pay 10 million. Large cap went up by 5%. So you will get the large cap index return of 5%. Net effect is that you pay 5% of 5 million. So clearly you did not benefit in this case because you are making the payment. Now I want you to do example three from the curriculum. A quick summary of what we've talked about in this reading. You need to understand swap markets at a high level. Recognize that swaps are traded in the over the counter market. These are custom instruments and we have a network of dealers and end users who engage in swap related transactions. So you can think of the market as being very similar to the market for forward contracts. We talked about the different ways of terminating a swap. One method is that a party that is losing makes a payment based on the value of the swap to the counterparty. But for that to happen, both parties need to agree at the start or at, at swap initiation that this option is possible. Another strategy is to take a offsetting position with another counterparty. A third and unlikely scenario is that you sell the contract, but given that swap markets are not very liquid, the selling is not so easy. And the fourth option is to use a swap option. Then you need to be on top of the three types of swaps shown over here. Currency swaps, 
interest rate swaps and equity swaps. In currency swaps, we are dealing with two different currencies such as the dollar and the euro. At the start, the principal amounts are normally exchanged. So one party will borrow dollars, the other party will borrow euro. The party borrowing dollars will then make interest payments in dollars. The party borrowing euro will make interest payments based on the euro. And then at the end of the swap, the notional amounts will be returned. So the party that borrowed dollars will return dollars. The party that borrowed euro will return euros. With interest rate swaps, you need to be on top of the most basic type of an interest rate swap, which is called a plain vanilla interest rate swap. There, one party pays based on a floating rate such as LIBO and the other party pays based on a fixed rate. This party is called the fixed rate pair and the party paying based on a variable rate such as LIBO is called the floating rate pair. Finally, we talked about equity swaps where at least one party is making payments based on some sort of an equity return. And the two characteristics of equity swaps which are quite testable are, number one, that the fixed rate pair at times might need to make variable payments. This is when the equity return goes down. And the second distinguishing feature is that the payment amount is determined at the end of every settlement period. As always, I want you to read the summary, review the learning objectives. There were a few examples and I asked you to do them during the lecture, but if you did not do so, you can do them now. Do the practice problems in the curriculum and also do practice questions from other sources. That is it.